quit being the world's best kept secret. Your time is now. Welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show, where we'll be discussing leadership, business, human potential, inspiring you to live rich from the inside out. Unlock your creativity, stretch out of your comfort zone, break through your barriers, take inspired action, and achieve epic results. Now here's your host, three-time best-selling author, speaker, and certified executive coach, Deborah Kozowski. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Millionaire Woman Show. We bring you guests from around the world, inspiring you, motivating you, and making you sparked into action to live your life rich from the inside out with principles of leadership, life, and business. Today, I have a very special guest, and uh, she comes highly endorsed from other podcast guests. That's the best way to have new people on the show is when other authors, other people who are connected share the opportunities with others, but not only that, that they are part of the message of knowing what people's mission are, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I'd love to see more people do is endorsing and sharing other people's work in you know letting them know how great they are and how they're making an impact in the world and today's guest does so author speaker and businesswoman mitzi purdue holds a ba with honors degree from harvard university and an mpa from george washington university she is the past president of 400 uh, sorry, 40,000 member American agri-women, a former syndicated columnist for Scripps Howard and her television series Country Magazine was syndicated to 76 stations. She is the founder of Series Farms, a family owned company that owns commercial and residential real estate plus agriculture land, including vineyards that sell wine grapes to wineries such as Modavi, Bogo, Voli, do and toasted head. Mitzi Purdue's book, How to Make Your Family Business Last, gives practical advice on how family businesses can develop a culture that supports keeping the family business in the family. And her advice can be useful as for multi-generational family. Her I've lived it experience comes from the membership in two long-lasting family enterprises. Her family of origin began in 1840 with the Henderson Estate Company, forerunner of Sheraton Hotels, in which her father co-founded. Purdue Farms, she's Frank Purdue's widow, began in 1920, and she loves to share advice on creating enduring families. Most recently, she's co-authored How to Be Up in Down Times. Her co-author, Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, series. Well, please welcome Mitzi Purdue to the show. Well, what a joy to be here. Thank you for including me. I'm, I'm so honored. Well, I'm so excited that you're here. Um, what vast accolades and what diverse experience to bring to our listeners and just tapping into your why, because it really has shown a trajectory of how far you've come and one of the things that you know when i think of your book titles it's all not only about resistance it's perseverance but it's stepping into a greater purpose so i would love to just kick it off with mitzi did you ever think you'd be here never ever 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 <laughs> ever no because i actually started out fairly shy and i had a reason for being shy uh, I had a terrible lisp. It was, and a lisp, by the way, you know, you can hear it, but if it's bad enough, you can see it as well. And people whom I'd get to know well would tell me that when they first met me, they assumed that I was stupid. Because a lisp, you know, it, it I mean, well, I'm just telling you the facts. People yeah. would tell me that that's how they perceive me. And, you know, that certainly made me a shy person. But so how did you step out of that shyness into the woman you are today? Well, in, it happened when I was 34 years old. And up until then, I had actually dreamed of a career in communications. And as, as you mentioned in your introduction, I did 
I did get a job in television, but I had actually never tried for all the things that I really wanted to mm. for, for a couple of reasons. One is I was held back by the list. Uh, the other thing was I was afraid of failure. I was afraid, you know, I could have been a writer, which actually I did become, uh, but the fear of rejection letters and so forth just kept me kind of paralyzed. But everything changed almost in a matter of minutes because at age 34, I was a rice farmer. I was growing rice in Northern California and you can be very shy and, and grow rice. It worked for me. But I had a tenant, a tenant farmer who had such an unusual circumstance. I'm gonna change his name to protect the guilty, but we will call him Peter Smith. Peter Smith had an IQ of over 200 points. And you know, there, there's like one in a million who has an IQ that high. Mm -hmm. And there was even an article about him in, U in Psychology Today, and we're talking like 1974. Yeah. Well, this article in U.S. in Psycho let me, Psychology Today, uh, it talked about how there were 40 kids who calibrated the Stanford Binet IQ tests, and he was one of those 40. He was one of the quiz kids. And it, this article told what became of the people with these huge, impressive IQs, most every one of them had a disastrous life. You know, they, they became early suicides, alcoholics. They died in car accidents where they shouldn't have, you know, maybe they were speeding or just in one way or another. It was not beneficial to them to have this amazing IQ. But Peter Smith was different. Uh, he, he grew rice in Northern California and he worked for me. Uh, well, his story was that very young, he knew that he's really smart, and he had this he had this dream of writing a great book that would be sort of his giving back to the world for this great gift that he had been given of having such a high IQ. Well, when he was 20, he conceived of writing this book. It was going to be called Life, an Owner's Manual. But at 20, he sensibly decided, you know, I can't go telling the world what to do when I'm only 20. I'm too wet behind the ears. I, you know, I'll, I'll keep collecting information until I'm more mature. Yeah. Well, at 30, he felt the same way, 40, 50, 60. He was always delaying it. And then at age 68, when he was working for me, he was diagnosed with terminal heart disease. They didn't think that he, they could keep him alive long enough to have quadruple bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, if, if you or I or any of our listeners or our audience had a death sentence, you know, what could be worse? But there is one thing that could be worse, and Peter Smith had that worst thing, which is his whole life he had been aiming towards this one thing, writing the great book. And now that he was going to die, his whole life's purpose, you know, poof. Yeah. But, but a miracle happened. I don't know if you've heard of the Pritikin Clinic, but it has an extraordinary record of helping people with heart disease. They have you know, a very strict diet. I think it's vegetarian. Uh, a lot of exercise, a lot of mindfulness, a lot of spirituality. And when you put it all together, he went for a month and a miracle happened. His heart disease receded. His heart revascularized. And now we're coming to the point where my life entirely changed. He came back. He could, he could walk 10 miles instead of barely able to walk across the room. He had energy, you know, he was ready to take on life. And the fact is he lived another 30 years. He lived into his late nineties. Wow. So when, when he told me this wonderful news, I told him, Peter, this is so wonderful. Write your book. And he said, yes, I'm just about to, just a little bit more research and I'll be ready. And I bet you can guess that he never did write the book. Mm -hmm. But it, I realized, and I knew him well, so I guess you almost have to take my word for it. Please do. I knew him well enough to know why he wasn't writing the book. He was afraid of failure. He was mm -hmm. afraid that if he wrote, you know, if he gave everything he possibly could to this thing and it wasn't a success, uh, his whole life would be a failure. And he didn't want to take that risk. But I, as his friend, and you know, looking you know, a little bit from a distance, I realized that he was doing the only thing that completely guarantees failure, and that's not to try. 
Mm -hmm. started thinking, but that's what I've done. I haven't tried to overcome my list. I haven't sent out articles. Uh, I haven't collected rejections. And so I decided to redefine failure. Failure is not that you get your, you get a rejection or you fail your audition. No, mm -hmm. that's a badge of honor. That's, that's telling that you paid your dues, that you put yourself out there. And uh, in, in the following year, I began sending articles out to magazines and newspapers. And you know, within a year, I became a syndicated columnist. And as for the list, uh, I went to a, a speech therapist. And the speech therapist, you know, she's happy to see me and all, but she said, nope, at your age, we can't help you. And I don't know if that would be true today, because we're talking, what, almost 50 years later. Mm -hmm. But back then, uh, they didn't have the tools to deal with somebody who had a lisp if you're, if you're an adult. So she said, sorry, we can't help you. Well, I really wanted a job in television. I, w I went to another speech therapist, and she said, I'm terribly sorry, we can't help you. I went to a third, and the third one said, I'm terribly sorry, I can't help you, but I'd be delighted to take your money. You can come. I can't do you any good, but I'll, we can go through the program. Yeah. Well, for nine months, no success of any sort. None. I couldn't hear the difference. I couldn't figure out where to put my tongue. Oh. But then somewhere around nine months, I began to hear the difference. And by a year, I'd lost my lisp, and my life completely changed. And Within that year, I got a job in television. I got a job with the Coast to Coast Radio Network. I was a syndicated columnist. And every bit of it traces back to that moment when Peter Smith said, oh, I'm just about to try. Mm. And how many of us, like I'm, I'm thinking of, there's been times, even myself, um, people I've talked to that, you know, if we just hold off a little bit longer, wait till things are a little bit more perfect or, Maybe I won't be found out in the process. I know a lot of people oh, yeah. suffer from that imposter syndrome. I and still have it. I still yeah. have it. I mean, in theory, you should outgrow it, but uh, I still have it. I, I then, personally remind people that if you're in the process, are you truly an imposter? Or are you practicing to be that in root of, right? Oh, I love that way of looking at it because... Mm, that's helping me right now because, I mean, I would love to outgrow imposter syndrome, but I know how far I've come and I started thinking, how did I get here? But here I am. Uh, I've written 20 books. My, I was, there was a period, and th this is, you know, off, after falling in my face dozens of times, but, and getting turned down probably, I think it was 32 times, uh, I, I became a syndicated columnist for Scripps Howard. And my column, I was the most widely syndicated environmental writer in the country. My column went to 420 newspapers. But, you know, if I had given up af after the first few rejections, uh, one of the most fun, enjoyable, impactful, delightful parts of my life wouldn't have happened. And I wanted to go on about, uh, I'd said that I was going to redefine failure mm -hmm. as a result of watching Peter Smith. And that, that failure is not trying and not giving your all. Well, I decided that every single rejection letter, that I would look at it as I'm paying my dues, that it's not going to drop in my lap, that you know, I have to work at it and I have to have some bad things happen along the way, but I'm going to persist. That persistence is, you know, really taking people in a direction, especially, you know, in, in uncertain times, like when I, you know, when I think of your book, how to be up and down times, that persistence, that perseverance, that determination that you don't lose sight of what's important to you. And um, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about how that plays a factor in when you think of failure. Well, failure hurts. Let's just stipulate that it does. But, um, I'm going to guess that almost anything that counts, you, I mean, maybe there are some people who get lucky, but I think for the rest of us, it takes a big, long, hard slog. And, you know, I've, I've had people ask me, what kept me going when, 
for, for nine months of getting nowhere overcoming the lisp. And it was, it was even a little bit harder than I've described because the therapist who would finally take me, she, it was a two hour round trip to get to her and she was charging an arm and a leg. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've sometimes even wondered, and if, if you have any insight on this, help me, but, but what kept me at it? But I guess, I guess if you have a vision of what you want, you know, if you, if you know where you want to get, and it's clear enough to you where you want to get, maybe it gives you the backbone to, to keep on when it's, when it's discouraging. So Mitzi, do you, do you think it has to do with that you already saw yourself, you saw that vision and you have such an emotional connection to being on TV, to writing the columns, to being in front of people because of your message? I guess, you know, I have a wish for everybody else, but it's certainly for me also. And that is to me, an ideal world is one in which everybody can be all that they can be. And I felt, I guess I felt an obligation if I had gifts, you know, like Peter Smith's gifts, if I had gifts, maybe some knowledge, some ability to share, uh, that it was wrong to, to not live up to my potential. And so I guess, I guess I was really motivated by thinking I should live up to my potential. Yeah. But, but again, that's what I wish for everybody else as well. So. <laughs> well, this conversation has sparked me to think of a Jana Stanfield song, um, If I Were Brave. And there's a line in the song, I don't remember the exact line right now, but it said, imagine if anything you wanted to be was to, to be true for you to everyone, if everyone that they imagined that they could be, what they dream of doing, that is already wished for you. And I think people would really step into that potential more fully, knowing that it's meant for them, instead of having that fear of failure. And I would challenge everyone listening to Mitzi and my conversation that tonight I want, or whatever time of day you're watching this, or listening to it here on iTunes or whatever podcast player you're listening to is that you have this opportunity to imagine whatever you dream of right now to be it fulfilled. Because here Mitzi's being a prime example of sometimes you don't know why you consistently pursue something, but if you trust that you are here for a greater purpose and you trust that, that message that is coming through you or the craft that you are performing. You could be a surgeon, you could be a police officer or a firefighter, you could be a farmer. That whatever you are doing, that you are honing a craft and you're bringing it forth because it's coming through you and it's not just around you. You know, you've, you've just expressed something that's so deep in my heart that, um, well, again, it, it all gets back to whatever your gifts are. There's, there's a quote from, from Mother Teresa that, that you know, if, if, if I quote her, it's, it's you know, aspirational. It's, it's not that I do it, but, but she says the good that we can do, we must do. Mm. And, and I kind of feel that, that that's at least what I feel I'm here for, that the good that we can do, we must do. Absolutely. And, and I also have a purpose in life, which is uh, I feel that I'm here to, increase happiness and decrease misery. Well, you've already done that here. I'm so grateful to have you here today. So I'm going to um, continue on with some of the questions that I have for you. And, you know, you've gotten to see some extraordinarily successful people close hand. And you've watched your father bring the Sheraton hotel chain from no employees to one hotel to 400 hotels and 20,000 employees at the time of his death. What are some of the millionaire techniques and attitudes that you learned from him that the rest of us could use? Okay, I have, I have a wonderful one that I think only a daughter or possibly a wife might know because I got to watch it real up close and personal. And I don't think you're ever gonna study this in the Harvard Business School or in business magazines or anything. But you know, when I was a little girl, you know, he was a very successful man and it was really clear to me that, that he was. And so I'd ask him, you know, how did you do it? 
and some of the stories that I grew up with from him. Uh, let, let me share with you, well, a tip and an attitude, but I hope it's actually a collection of tips and attitudes, because he told me that every, he began his, his career, or at least the hotels, in the 1930s, and it was a period a little bit like today, where in, in the Great Depression, there was 25% unemployment, and people really were depressed. I mean, it was, a, it was a genuinely difficult time and they didn't know when it was going to end. And there was war looming off in the future. I mean, it was just a really rough, difficult time. And that was also a time when everybody who had hotels was dumping them as, fa as fast as they could. I mean, ho the hotel industry, basically it was going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And so what led father to get into the hotel business when everybody was running away from it? Now, what was his secret sauce that made him able to be a success? And, you know, are there any of the things that he did that, that we could do today? And I will share with you what he told me. He said, whenever he would take over a hotel, the day that he took possession, he'd invite all the employees, and there could be 400 of them, there could be 800 of them, mm -hmm. to come into the hotel ballroom, you know, to meet the new owner. But he knew that every one of them would be just demoralized and afraid that they're going to be fired. And back then, if you were fired, you know, if you lost your job, it was the bread line. You weren't going to get another job because at 25% unemployment, nobody was hiring. Well, so the first words out of his mouth were, every one of you keeps your job. And I want you to keep your job because I know that you know your job better than anybody else in the world. And it's my job to give you the resources to show the world just how good you are. Because you're going to see in a couple of months, this hotel is going to be the most successful, the best served, the most financially stable in the whole city. And not only that, we're going to be an example. We're going to show the rest of the city that things can turn around and that things can, you know, that there can be a brighter future. Well, imagine what you, know, you as an employee felt. You know, I'm going to assume that just from the depths of almost despair, suddenly here's somebody who believes in you. And Father told me that people have a compulsion to live up to or down to your expectations. And that brings me to part two of this story, which is that's what he did the first day. The second day, imagine you're a worker in the hotel. Maybe you're a bartender. Maybe you're a maid cleaning rooms or waiting on table you would see just a whole cavalcade of like plumbers and decorators and electricians who would come in to spruce up the hotel. Because, you know, the hotel, if, if it got sold, it was probably, you know, it's probably gone to seed. Well, all these people who are coming to freshen up the hotel, they don't go to the areas that the paying public's going to see. No, they go to the areas that only the, the employees ever get to see, like the employee dining rooms lockers, showers, uh, kitchens, you know, all these places that the, 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 the paying public never sees. Mm -hmm. And so I asked father, why did you spend money there where you're not going to get it back? You know, I, I would think you'd put the money first into making it more attractive to the paying public. And he said that this was a way of communicating to them how much he believed in them and how important they were. And again, people live up to or down to your expectations. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a, a wise way of looking at things? But then I asked him, well, when you're standing up there with in front of 400 new people, why didn't you, you know, why did you promise them that they could keep their jobs? Why shouldn't they earn it in some way? And he said, no. He said that persuasion or getting people to do what you want, influence, it, and this is you know, how he viewed it. He says it comes in three flavors. He said, I could have stood up there in front of them and I could have said, shape up or you're fired. And that, the flavor of that is intimidation. You know, the three flavors, the first is intimidation. And he said, you can get people to do what you want, but they do it grudgingly and they won't do even one little smidgen more. So intimidation works, but it doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. He said, I could have stood up there and told them, there's a raise waiting for you if you do a really good job. There's bonuses. But Father said, 
that's a really bad strategy also because that's bribery. Mm -hmm. And he said, bribery, it's too transactional. People will work for the bribe, but they won't work for anything bigger. And if you really want a success, uh, you want people to go the extra mile. You want them to be committed to it. So he said, you know, intimidation, bribery, not very effective. He said, what does work is, drum roll please, what does work is inspire, don't require. Mm. And so he said, a, a leader's job is to give people a better vision of themselves. That's the inspiration. And he said, the idea is you're, you're waiting on table, you're making beds. You could just think I'm waiting on table, I'm making beds, I'm tending bar. Or you could be thinking, I'm part of a team that is going to make this the best hotel in the whole city. We're going to be an inspiration to the rest of the city. We're going to show people that it can be done. And so the end result of, of his human relations approach was that people stayed with him for life. They regularly went the extra mile. They used all their creativity and commitment to make the hotel great. And from that, he'd make enough money to buy more hotels. And so one hotel eventually grew to 400. Cool. So he focused on people and he yeah. saw potential in every single person around him. Well, again, people have, this is quoting him, people have a compulsion to live up to or down to your expectations. So you communicate in every possible way. That, that you believe in them and that you expect the best of them and, and you give them the resources and the encouragement and look where it took him. That's amazing. Now, as his daughter, how has that influenced you when you, you know, you talked about the lisp or, you know, you're just for your relationship with having this figure that continually saw potential in people? Uh well, something I'm kind of proud of as an em employer myself, uh, both in the farms and then in a production company and just other things that I'm into. Uh, I, I have a somewhat unbroken record for people who work with me, like Cindy Downs who works with me. Uh, she's been with me for 30 years. That if you work for me, there are only two ways that you can leave. And one is to get married, yay. <laughs> and the other is you die. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> but, but I think some of the human relations techniques that, that my father, that I got to observe from my father, helped me as, in, as being an employer. And I mean, I do everything I can to make the people that I work with feel that they're valued and treasured and that I couldn't possibly survive a day without them. So let me ask you this. What did your daughter, father bring out in you? to, you know, how you say raise up or live down to expectations. What, what expectations did he have for you? Well, you know, one of the things in my family, I would, I would describe us, there were five of us, and I would describe us as a very high functioning family. Uh, nobody ever did drugs. Nobody, uh, to use the delicate phrase from the 1950s, nobody kicked over the traces. And what that means is got pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, you know, I think both parents just expected us to be contributing citizens. And you know, we were always brought up with the idea that, that you have to give back, that you've been given a lot. And that means you have to be super, how about generous? Um, my, both my late husband and the family that I grew up with endorsed the following thought. And this is something that comes from Frank Perdue, but my, my, family of origin would endorse it totally. Mm -hmm. If you want to be happy, think what you can do for somebody else. If you want to be miserable, think what's owed to you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that sure turned out well in my life. Focusing on the other person versus focusing on ourselves to raise that happiness and that joy. Because often I think people think that they're not seen or heard or validated or even sometimes appreciated and when we just take those few moments to say hey i see you and i hear you and you matter makes a big difference i think it makes all the difference in the world i think 
I'm not sure even how to formulate it other than that I believe it, that, that father was right. I mean, he said his entire success depended on the people whom he worked with. But, you know, getting back to generosity of spirit for a second, mm -hmm. father told me, you know, he was obviously a, a very, very, very wealthy man. Uh, I mean, if you own 400 hotels and he owns some other stuff as well, having started by the way with a war bonus of $1,000 between him and his brother and his uh, roommate from college, and then I built it up into, well, wealth. Uh, he told me that the greatest pleasure that his wealth ever gave him was in giving it away. Mm. Is that not cool? That's very cool. Yeah, what, what an example for his children. And he also brought us up to be frugal. Uh, he, he didn't want us to get our identity from spending money. He wanted us to get our identity from service. And, and something that, that I just treasure that they did. And I've been trying to give tips that might be useful to other people. The tip I'm about to give right now probably isn't very useful, but I'll share it anyway. Uh, he didn't want his children to have what he called uh, rich man's disease. That is growing up spoiled and not giving back, being takers rather than givers. And among the things that both my parents did with all their five children, we, we went to private schools, but we also went to public schools. He wanted us, or my parents wanted us, not to live in a, in a total bubble of wealth. And I'm just so grateful for that because I went to school with the son of a policeman, with the daughter of a dairy woman, uh, with a woman, the daughter of somebody who worked behind the jewelry counters at Gilcrest. It was, uh, you know, if, if anybody who is listening to us ends up a millionaire or is a millionaire, uh, keep your kids grounded and have them go to public schools as well, uh, as, well as pri the private schools that you could probably afford. Yeah, I think diversity and just being, in, it's a rich culture, it's a rich environment for people to grow up in, knowing that everyone walks a different path in life, but yeah. we all can reach for dreams and goals and achievement. But when we serve each other, that's when we come out the strongest. I'm so agree with that. I mean, to me, that's, I have a theory of what life's about. It's serving one another. Mm hmm you're definitely a servant leader. I love it. You oh, also well, can I talk about my late husband then? Speaking yeah, I was just going to ask you about him. Because <laughs> um, he, he went from no employees to 20,000 at, at, at the time of his death. And what tips and attitudes can we learn from him as well that the rest of us could use? Because you, you've had these two significant men in your life who have taught you many things that now you're able to share with the rest of us. And I know that even though you're sharing them, I am, I'm really inspired that it's coming from you because it's coming in your way. Well, I, I figure that you know, we each have our talents and I think my particular talent, my superpower was <laughs> to be able to observe how they did it. And you know, I was, I didn't just take it for granted. And I used there were so many things about Frank that I just adored among them. And this is something that I aspire to and am a hundred percent unable to achieve, but I recommend it to everybody else. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> wow. I used to observe him, you know, he, like my father, he was a mega successful guy. Uh, but in almost every situation I ever saw him in, whether it was a social situation or a business situation or walking through the, the chicken plants, he would listen 90% of the time and talk 10% of the time. Mm. And I, I have a couple of theories about why he did that. And one of my theories of why he did it, why he was a listener more than a talker, was I think it makes people feel important when you listen to them. And he was totally about making people feel important. In fact, I have a quick story about what happened when we first married and making people feel important. Uh, we had just come back from our honeymoon and we were walking on a beach in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. It was, it was very late summer and almost nobody there and it was as romantic as could be and we're carrying our sandals, walking barefoot on the beach. And suddenly I look up at my new husband and I tell him, Frank, 
I think we should entertain every single person who works for the company. And he said, no, that's not possible. There's 16,000. And so I pretended that I didn't realize that he was saying no. And I said, and I think we should have them a hundred at a time. And he said, no, that's way too many. And I said, let's start in six weeks. I think we could put it together that fast. No, that's way too soon. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, and I just went barreling along as if, as if I didn't understand that he was saying no. And we went round and round with me saying, I think we should start with the secretaries because they can tell people that our parties are fun and not scary. And anyway, we, you know, he's looking at me as if I've sat down from another planet. But as, as we kept talking, uh, you know, gradually I, his, you know, his body language was communicating to me that, you know, he's thinking maybe there's something there. And then finally, you know, he says, I like it, let's do it. And I know why he was, why he was hesitant because he was basically a shy man. And the idea of having a hundred people in his house three times a month for the next forever, you know, it turned out to be 17 years. Wow. Uh, but that, you know, that was just way, way, way beyond his comfort zone. But the reason that he agreed to it was like my father, he was always looking for ways of making people feel important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at that time he employed, employed 16,000 people. And uh, we, we had at our parties, there, there were buffets and, yeah, we, we had everybody, whether it was the truckers or the sanitation workers or the accountants, and we did start with the secretaries. But what was so cool about these parties, and by the way, I thought of the parties because I grew up in the hospitality industry and, you know, it just seemed normal to me. Well, anyway, at these parties, we had this great big long buffet table and Frank used to wait on his employees. I mean, there he was serving them. And is that not cool? I mean, literally servant leadership. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the evening, he'd talk about what was going on in the company. He'd tell them, you know, here's maybe, maybe, I mean, imagine that you're a trucker. Uh, and you hear from the great big boss, you know, the person whose name is on your paycheck, you hear from the boss, what's going on in the company? Yo, know, hey, we got this wonderful new contract or we're just getting into, and he'd name some new city that we were expanding into, or he'd tell the things that had gone wrong. Uh, you yeah, know, we lost the so-and-so contract. Uh, you know, he, he would talk with them the way he would talk with the board of directors, mm -hmm. just letting them know what was really, really, really going on in the company. Yeah. And then he'd answer questions and he's very good at it. The person's question was, and then at the end of it, he'd, he'd look at a hundred people and he'd tell them in, in different words, different times, but it would always boil down to this. I know the company wouldn't be what it is today without you. And I got a feeling, you know, people would tell me at the end of the party that, <clears throat> that they had enjoyed it, but I actually attended funerals where the next of kin would tell me that the most meaningful event in the deceased's life was being entertained at the big boss's home. Yeah. And it's all because you started planting a seed. You saw something. And I'll have to say, part of it must have been done for love. <laughs> oh, well, no. But, but I have, <laughs> remember, my whole background and training is hospitality. So, yes, exactly. So I, I, I'm, actually, Frank even told me that he loved, you know, at first he was hesitant, this all got out. Uh, yeah. but, but when he got into the groove and realized that the parties were fun, I mean, like fun, yeah. uh, he told me that he just loved to see the house come alive with, with people enjoying themselves. Mm. So um, yeah, that's but, definitely energy to feed off of. Yeah. And so for a shy man, I think, you know, part of the attraction between us is, um, I think I filled a side of him that he enjoyed, but that I don't think that, it didn't come naturally to him to instigate it. But once, yeah. once it was there and going, I think he loved it. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like he was very charismatic. And oh, unbelievably. He connect with people and build rapport very quickly. Well, you know, one of the things I mentioned that, that wherever I'd observed him, he was more into listening, which, by the way, translates into you're important. Uh, 
But at these parties, or actually wherever I saw him, when he was focusing on you, you know, listening to you, you were the most important person in his universe. You just felt enveloped by this presence that cared and was interested in you. And then, you know, another thing that he did that I'm told, you know, people have told me that what I'm about to describe is rare. Uh, I can't know, but I love feedback on it. We used to visit plants. There, there are 16 plants. And we would go through, you know, through the lines and talk with people, you know, who were, who were working on the line. And the number of names that he knew, I mean, I bet he knew thousands of names. He, he just made the effort to learn people's names. And would it, when he'd be introducing me to Delcy, he'd tell me, uh, Delcy has just had something wonderful happen. Her son got accepted to whatever college he was accepted at. You know, he'd, he'd not just know their names, but he'd know things about them. And then something else that I just treasured, you know, because, you know, I'm here partly participating in whatever we're doing, but also observing, I would notice that his attitude going, you know, talking with the people who are working with them, the hourly workers, his attitude was never kind of nose in the air, I'm important, I'm the big boss. No, mm -hmm. it was that we're part of a team and I've got my role, but I infinitely respect your role. We're all important in this enterprise of providing food for people. Yeah, I like the equality that we're on the same level. Yeah, and, and you know, a further example of that was, I don't think I can count the number of employee cafeterias that I've eaten in with him or sometimes even by myself because um, why not? I mean, you meet interesting people and I loved it. In fact, I, I can remember one time I was in an employee cafeteria at an Acomat, Virginia plant and I was sitting there, you know, nice place to eat and I like the food and there's really good chicken there. Uh, and an African-American woman, uh, I end up sitting beside her and she's really curious about my life. You know, what's it like to be Mrs. Frank Verdue? And I thought, yeah, we talked for a while. And then I thought turnabout's fair play. So I asked her about her life. And uh, you might have the impression that I did that working in the plant is, is you know, boring and repetitious and oh my God, who would do that? But she was telling me that she enjoyed it and she looked forward to coming to work every day. And I said, how can that be? Uh, I mean, I hope I was more diplomatic than that, but yeah, that's, that's the bottom line was me just puzzling over how it could be enjoyable. Yeah. And she said, the only way I can convince you is if you'll come and work for a day in the plant. And I said, in a heartbeat, I'll come tomorrow if you can arrange it, if you can get your supervisor to allow me to come in and work beside you for a day, I'll do it. Well, I did. You know, a couple of days later, um, I ended up, you know, where if, if you're in a chicken plant, you're wearing a hairnet, you can't wear rings um, because I don't want something to drop into to the food. Um, you're, you're wearing like a laboratory coat. You know, you're, you're, it, it's a whole costume that you're wearing. And so there I am in, in my cap and, uh, and hairnet and white lab coat. And this woman, her job was you hang the chickens in shackles that are going by. It's, uh, and you know, it looks kind of easy, but actually it's, it's, it's difficult. It's sort of like, <laughs> well, if, if I ask, if you watch a secretary typing and you've never typed before, yeah. It, 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 it's a real skill and so this you know what she was doing took skill and here I am trying to do the same thing and totally failing at it uh, but here's what I learned from a day of, of working in the chicken plant uh, that it was fun because everybody's talking with each other they're talking about mm -hmm. uh, last night's sitcom they're talking about who got married they're talking about last night's date they're they're talking about clothes they're talking about sales they're they're telling jokes uh, and uh, I was the butt of a lot of joking because I couldn't get, you know, it, it took me half an hour to get one foot in and you're supposed to get two in. And the guy standing beside me, uh, almost as a joke, he started hanging two at a time when I couldn't, and that's four feet in the right place when I couldn't get one. And, 
Yeah, there was there was a whole lot of laughter, and I I, I felt it was good natured laughing because I mean I was not good at this. I was worth exactly what they paid me. Oh. <laughs> But but it was a wonderful experience because, you know, I ended up really liking them. And at the end, uh, it was so fun because for, you know, for eight hours, I'm I'm absolutely failing at this job. But at the end of it, you know, there that plant, I think it has 1,200 people and they all wanted to have photographs of me. So I went from being, you know, the bottom to kind of being the top. And that was, I mean, it, it was just a fun experience. But you let yourself be vulnerable. To, a, to let people see you for you and that you were needing to learn something, that you weren't the expert at something, that, you know, often people can come in and just say, you know what, I, I'm really great at this. Just just give me a chance. Let me show you, right? And no, you, I suck. You went, in very I open. Suck. <laughs> you went in there very open. I grew up on a farm. Um, yeah. I, I could never, you know, catch the, chick <laughs> catch the chicken. <laughs> that was not my role. And a good thing too, my dad would be broke. Um, thank you for sharing so much about your your father and your you know your late husband. I want to know a little bit more about your career as well. You were for almost a decade most widely syndicated environmental writer in in the country. Your column went to four hundred and twenty newspapers. You hosted TV show that was syndicated across seventy six stations and a radio show, Coast to Coast Radio Network. Any tips to share on your own career success? Um, yeah, the, the, the biggest thing that's guided my career is think big. I mean, why not? And then the second thing is, I've already said this, but don't be afraid of failure. It's, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of turndowns. Uh, but, you know, one other thing is I felt that I worked like crazy to, well, let me give you an example of getting my television show syndicated. There came a day when I realized that I could make an awful lot more money for the same amount of work for my television show if I could get it syndicated. And, you know, it's true. There was, <laughs> there was just money dropping from the sky practically when you're syndicated. So, you know, anybody who's listening, uh, think about syndication. But again, it didn't drop in my lap. I want to back up a little bit because I'm going to talk about what it took to get syndicated, but a piece of advice that I'd give to anybody is if you've set your heart on something, and I do recommend thinking big because there's a lot of room at the top. It's just kind of surprising. But in any case, figure out what you want and then figure out the steps to get there. In my case, part of it was learning salesmanship. And so I read books on it right and left, and I took the Dale Carnegie salesmanship course. Uh, I interviewed people who were good at sales. So, and you know, I, I totally recommend learning sales for anybody because um, one of the things that I learned in the, my salesmanship course was that nothing happens until somebody makes a sale. And what they mean by that is a lot of life is persuasion. You're selling an idea, you're selling politics, you're selling, in my case, a TV show. So part of it was, uh, maybe almost a year-long effort to learn everything I could about sales. But then there was the question of how do you get in front of the people who could be buyers? But since I was the hostess of a TV show in Sacramento, I began actually scouring the newspapers to see who might want to sponsor a farm show or a, a country show, which is what I had. Mine, mine was Country Magazine. And one day I saw that Dale Wolf, who is a group vice president for DuPont, which has, uh, which has an agricultural division, that he would be in the Sacramento area. So I quick invite him on my show. And totally with the idea that, uh, that I would make a sales presentation to him. So he comes on my show and I had yeah, the whole crew knew what I was up to. So, you know, the make makeup person is just making sure that he has a wonderful experience and they, uh, you know, they, they coddle him, they, they act as he's, he's the most important person in the world. And at the end of the show, which thank heaven it did go well, I, I told him that I had an idea for something that DuPont might want to sponsor. 
And I told him sort of a very brief overview of it. And he said, you know, maybe there's something to it. I'll, if you're ever in Wilmington, Delaware, which is 3,000 miles away, if you're ever in Wilmington, Delaware, um, you know, come by and present it. Well, guess who happened to be in Wilmington, Delaware, well, you know, like a week later. And uh, so I talked it over with him at absolute great length. And he said, you know, there's, there's a lot to it. Why don't you write up a proposal? So I went home and, you know, using all the resources that, that I could think of to help me write this proposal, I wrote the best proposal I could, but then the best part of, of from my point of view of, of the sales technique that I used is when I had been at DuPont, I had met probably eight or 10 people who worked for Dale Wolf and I, of course, had gotten their cards and now I have my proposal written and I serially called each one of them and read parts of the proposal to them and asked for their advice. And you know, <laughs> by the end of, of getting their advice, you know, I, I learned things you should never say at DuPont, you know, that, that just rubs everybody the wrong way. And I learned the right buzzwords. And so by the end of it, my proposal was almost completely different from, from what I'd come up with in my own. But you know, it was clearly much, much better with all this advice I'd been getting. Uh, so I send it to Dale Wolf. And Dale Wolf calls me up and he says, you know, I really like what I see here. Um, it's got a lot of potential, but I need to run it by my people to see what they think. Well, since they had helped write it. <laughs> oh, I, I, brilliant. I love it. Well, I got the show, but I'm, I'm telling that, that great, long, convoluted story to say that, that it didn't drop in my lap, that it, it took... Um, you know, many steps to get there, including there's one other. Uh, when, I, when I knew that I'd be interviewed by Dale Wolf, I, I put so much effort into learning everything I could about him. I mean, I used to think at the, way back then that I probably knew more about him than his psychiatrist would. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, 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 I certainly made it my business to, you know, everybody I met who knew him to find out, you know, what he liked and, and what you win points for and what you would lose points for. <laughs> and so, you know, the, well, anyway, it worked, but, but I do advise everybody, if, if, if you want something, figure out every step to get there and then do it, you know, pull the trigger. I, I, I had a, mot a, a motto for a while and it was ready, fire, aim. <laughs> You know, that you, you have to act. You can't be like my friend, I called him Peter Smith, the, yeah. the high IQ guy. Yeah. Um, that you can't just delay and delay. No, act. Have, have a propensity for action. I mean, preparation and action. Yeah. But I, what I loved is you built rapport. You knew that influence also comes from really connecting with the people who know. And asking, again, is very powerful in getting feedback from them to see what their take is, to learn those to-dos and not-to-dos, and very powerful in alignment. And well, I, you know, one of my theories of success, I mean, I do, I'm, I'm really in favor of, of integrity and honesty. I mean, that, that comes first. Mm -hmm. But second, uh, when you're dealing with anybody, whether it's a new organization or a new friend, uh, I try very hard to learn what you win points for and what you lose points for. Uh, you know, if, if like if, if I'm working in, in, for a new company, boy, my antenna are all the way up to Mars practically trying to figure out what the culture is, what you win points for and what you lose points for. Yeah. And, I, I, and in any organization I've ever worked for, um, I... My goal is not to be disruptive. I want to be such a valuable team member that people will listen to me, and that, that might take a year or two, but that they'll listen and they'll want to act. It's not that I'm starting out wanting to change things. Yeah. Mitzi, I think what I want to acknowledge, what I love about you the most, and this is the first time we've ever met, is 
how much you take time to listen and learn from others to know that that contribution of collective contribution is what makes things richer and really being part of the team, like, you know, going in there with the chickens and just being right in there, showing people that you're alongside them. You're a partner in the process. And I really admire that about you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And you recently... Oh, I've, I'm influenced by something Frank used to say. Oh, I mentioned that if, if he was in a meeting, maybe there are 10 or 12 executives, maybe who worked for him or worked with him, as he would put it. Oh, and he's talking 10% of the time and listening 90% of the time. And so I asked him, you know, Frank, why is this your MO? Why do you, why, why are you always listening? And he said, because none of us is as smart as all of us. Mm. Is that not a great attitude? Fantastic. Fantastic and, attitude. And then, you know, something else. He had absolutely no use for yes men. He didn't want to be told how wonderful he was, unlike me. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he wanted to hear what was wrong because he said, I can do so something about what's wrong. Um, I can't do anything about what's right. So... So he was, he was very receptive to people who worked with him telling him what was wrong. And I, I thought that was just a huge key to success. Definitely, definitely. And you recently wrote, and there's the picture of the book, How to Be Up in Down Times with your co-author, Mark Victor Hansen. Can you give us one big tip um, for being up during stressful times? I would love to share one of my favorite tips. And it's in the book but it has to do with happiness. And, and it has to do with what makes people happy and what doesn't make people happy. And in the book, I tell the story of Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France. <clears throat> and Napoleon, for his time, he had more wealth, more power, more influence, more riches, more women than probably anybody had ever had up to that time in the world. But did it make him happy? We didn't have to guess because he wrote, when he was in exile at the end of his days, he wrote, he was at St. Helena and he was writing, uh, you know, looking back on his life and he said he couldn't count five happy days. Mm. So all that wealth, power, influence, women, it didn't make him happy. Yeah. But Mother Teresa had a vow of poverty, the vow of humility and her, her earthly possessions, things that she actually owned were three cotton saris. That's, you know, the, the robe that they wear and her sandals. Those were her only, her only possessions. And other than if she was at a state banquet or something, she was, eat, this is a quote, eating the bread of the poor. In other words, she'd eat what, what poor people ate. Mm -hmm. So what was her life like? And towards the end of her life, she describes her life as a feast of unending joy. Mm. And the difference between those two was Napoleon was all about taking. It made him miserable. Mother Teresa was all about giving. Mm -hmm. It made her life a feast of unending joy. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for connecting that for us. Um, as you know, we're coming to the end of our interview, I would love to ask you, um, what is one book that has really impacted your life? There, there is a book. It's Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the reason it's so important to me is partly a family history. My father and my mother valued that book so much that they would reread it every 10 years. My husband got so much out of Dale Carnegie in the course that he paid for all his top executives to take the, the How to Win Friends and Influence People course. So I endorse the examples and, uh, and I share it because, you know, my father used to say that one of the most essential skills in the world is getting along with people. Mm. And Dale Carnegie is a shortcut to getting there. Yeah. 
I, we need more of that. By, I, I'm not paid by Dale Carnegie. <laughs> it's, it's, we need more it's, of that in the world for sure. Oh, well, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's helped me no end. Well, one of the other questions we like to ask all of our guests here, Mitzi, on the Millionaire Woman Show is what does it mean to you to live rich from the inside out? I think, all right, I want to have a life of service. I absolutely believe that something that my mother used to say, which is that the givers of the world are happy and the takers are miserable. And I'm also influenced by father who said the greatest joy his money ever gave him was giving it away. So for me, living rich in the inside is service. I think we're here to serve one another and that gives me joy. And I, I, I can't say that my life is a feast of unending joy, but it's pretty happy. I mean, I'll take it. Beautiful. You know, Missy, I could talk to you for great lengths of hours. You are such a joy to speak with. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure our audience would love to have you back as well. And I'd love for you to share with everyone how they can stay in touch with you, how they can get your books um, so they can have a piece of you with them. I would like nothing better. Well, to get the book, it's on Amazon and it's how to be up. And if you just type in how to be up, it will, it will come because thank heaven it's selling well enough so that it's, a, you know, it's kind of at the top of that list. And uh, you can get it on Kindle. I think it will set you back all of 99 cents. And uh, Mark Victor Hansen and his stepson, Preston Weeks, and I have deliberately made it very inexpensive. It's $4.95. And the reason it's inexpensive is we want as many people as possible to benefit from it because these are really tough times. And between the three of us, I think we've got some advice that I hope will make people's lives easier, better, helping them get through a time, my goodness, I'm, it's not easy. I'm 79 and it's not easy for me to remember a time this difficult. Uh, so we wrote it to be helpful and we've priced it low because we would love to have as many people benefit from it as possible. And how to contact me, uh, come to my website. It's mitziperdue.com. And at the, there's a contact page. And if you write to me, I promise I'll answer back because I love communication. I, I mean, this is what I live for. Mitzi, it's been such a joy. We're going to have all the contact information in our show notes to make sure that everyone can reach out to you. We'll have the book titles there as well and a link to your website. Um, you don't even look close to your age. <laughs> and uh, it's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you. Thank you for coming on the Millionaire Woman Show. It's, it's been a joy and an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And for everyone listening, thank you for joining us. Please go over to my website at www.debrakazowski.com where you can get your free uh, video course right now on making habits stick to put focus and consistency on your dreams and goals to make them or become a reality. We also want you to go over to the Millionaire Woman Show on iTunes, your favorite podcast player. Give us a like, a rating write a review, share this podcast with your friends, especially if something has resonated with you. I know I already have friends that I'm going to be sending this to saying, hey, you got to take a listen. I think it'll make a difference in your business um, mindset, attitude. That's a lot of what we talk about on the Millionaire Woman Show. And I know that moving forward, you can create that change by focusing on people, focusing on service, and together we can work on changing the world. As Muhammad Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And on behalf of Mitzi and myself, go out and have a fabulous day.